Building a successful blog on your own is a pretty complicated endeavor. It'd be kind of like trying to assemble IKEA furniture, but without any instructions. There's too much going on. Let me kind of show you what I mean. If you start just looking around the internet for information about how to do this, you're gonna find out that, oh, you gotta do keyword research, right? That's first. So there's that, right? We gotta do keyword research. And then uh, based on that, we can create content. So we're gonna write. Uh, we got some posts, so now what do we do with those? Oh, oh, we need to build backlinks like crazy. Use the link symbol, right? We need to build a ton of backlinks and uh, we need to write more posts, so we're gonna just like recycle this, we're gonna do that. And then, um, oh, but we need to monetize, right? And so we need uh, ads, we need uh, affiliate. Oh, but, so how do we do affiliate marketing? Um, well, we need to do product reviews. Well, how do we do product reviews? Well, um, do we need to actually get the products? Nah, who needs to do that, right? We're just gonna write product reviews without testing the products. And next thing you know, you've got this like super complex mess of stuff that all needs to be done. And who knows what order we do it all in? <laughs> At what point do we go back to writing posts again? Or what? how many backlinks do I need before it's okay to monetize? And there's so much stuff going on. Let's just like, Get rid of all that crap, right? Let's just approach this in a way that's systematic, that's proven, and that works. What I wanna to present to you today is a system. A system that we've come up with over years of experience at Income School, building dozens of our own blogs to success. We've worked with literally thousands of members of Project 24, which is our membership, where we teach this process. And we have been revamping our system to make it even better and even more kind of holistic to take you through your entire lifetime of blogging so you know exactly what to do at every stage. Here's the basics of how this type of business works and how we can build it in a way that's repeatable and that is long lasting. Most people who are trying all of these different methods, if they ever succeed, it will probably be for a short duration before their website starts to fail because they focus so much on the wrong things. Let me show you where the main focus of our efforts need to be if we wanna build a good content business. First of all, we start with helpful content that is matched with search intent. Keyword research is dead. We need to stop using those terminologies. It's not about keywords anymore. Search engines are smart enough now that they recognize that various searches that use totally different words can mean the same thing. It's all about what searchers are looking for and then creating helpful content that fulfills their need. Basically, that's like what every good business is built upon. Finding the right people, seeing what they need and fulfilling that need. See a need, fill a need. That comes from a kid's movie. This leads to eyeballs on our content. When we create helpful content that matches someone's search, the people come organically. That's exactly what search engines are intended to do. And there are billions of searches that are done every single day. When we get eyeballs on our content and we actually have good helpful content, that leads to revenue and impact. If all that you want in your blogging business is to make some money, that's an okay place to start. But the more that you do this, just like anything else you do in your life, you'll find that if money is the only driver, at some point it will not be sufficiently fulfilling. As we start to be successful with our blogs, we will realize that we also have the potential to have a significant impact on the world in some way. Come with me for just a minute while I illustrate what it is that we're accomplishing here with this blogging system. Imagine for a moment a website that you come across in doing a search. You need some information for one reason or another. It might be vitally important or it might just be something that you're curious about or need to know some information before you invest a lot of time and money into a hobby or a career path that you're considering. You do your search. Some content comes up, the title makes it seem highly relevant. You click into the blog post and you start reading it and you finish reading it and you still are no closer to the answer you were looking for. Have we not seen this before? What about when you go to a blog post and the answer really just ends up being like, you know, it really depends. And then they don't even go through the process of helping you figure out your answer. Well, what does it depend on? We end up with a whole bunch of fluff a whole bunch of um, product promotion, and we end up with nothing of value. 
I can't tell you how many times I've tried to compare products and I read a blog post that seems to be comparing the two products and I get little more than a list of the specs of the two products. That's not helpful. I need someone to tell me what the real differences are and what it was like to actually use them. That's the kind of content we're talking about. We want to create content that actually fulfills the need. If someone wants to compare two products and they land on your website, you want them to walk away knowing exactly what's going to work best for them. If they come to your website with a question about a topic, maybe a hobby that they're interested in, you want them to walk away with the answer to that question and with a plan of what it is that they're going to do about it. When we create this kind of helpful content, not only does it rank extremely well in Google, but it actually helps people, which leads us to make a substantially higher income because the more we help people, the more willing they are to spend their money with us. The more we help people, the more often they're likely to come back to our website for help in the future. There are very few blogs today that I follow. I don't ever really have a website where I check in every day or every other day to see what's new on that site. However, there are some websites that I know within a particular industry. If I have a question on that topic and that website shows up in the search result, I am going to their article because it is going to help me. Look, Google is smart. They're like other successful companies who have learned an important lesson, and that is that you grow the best by satisfying a customer. Now, there is a strong argument to be made that Google's maybe lost sight of that and maybe focused a lot more on profits lately than providing the best user experience, and you wouldn't be wrong. However, Google got to the place they are today, where most people use Google to perform most of their searches because they provided the best user experience for so long. So here's the deal. People have spent years looking for different ways to manipulate Google's algorithms to get their content, their websites to show up at the very top, uh, even if their content isn't the best content for that search. A lot of people refer to this as SEO, which is search engine optimization. The reality is though that this is only a small piece of SEO. There are aspects of SEO that we can do, things we can do, that helps make our content easier for search engines to recognize and to find and to rank. There are also ways that people have found to try to manipulate the algorithm to get their content to show up even when it's not the most relevant. However, because Google's so smart and they have so much money and so many good employees, they are really, really good at identifying those manipulations and closing those loopholes. That means that the people that are just relying on manipulation to get their content to rank often see massive drops in traffic every time Google updates their algorithm, and then they look for new loopholes. What we've done is we've built an entire system that is not meant to manipulate Google's algorithm or to look for loopholes within it. Rather, what we do is we create content that meets the intent of what Google's algorithm is trying to do which is to find the most relevant and accurate piece of content for the search that's being done. That's why this approach has been so repeatable by members of Project 24 and by those who've been following our methodologies by watching this YouTube channel. It is by far the best long-term strategy. And because of it, I don't really get worried when Google algorithm updates come around. Yes, they shuffle things and sometimes we see gains and sometimes we see small losses, but what we don't typically see are the drastic drops in traffic that a lot of site owners are seeing every time the algorithm sees a change. So this sounds like a pretty ideal world, right? Uh, we're sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya, but I wanna show you now exactly how it is that we're doing that. Let me walk you through the system that we're using for creating successful blogs. We're finally here. I don't think I can adequately communicate to you how excited I am to be able to walk you through the blogging system. About six months ago, I made a video that looked similar to this. I walked you through step-by-step step, sort of our approach to blogging and how to get to a full-time income in about 24 months. What we've done since then is taken that concept that we had from our original Project 24 blogging 60 steps um, to this concept that I talked about six months ago of phases, and we've built this out into a lifelong process so that you know exactly what to do in every stage of your blogging journey. We have a lot of members today in Project 24 who hit the full-time income. Whether it was 24 months, 18 months, or 30 months, they hit that objective and they started to do more. 
and then they started to do more. And they've been so tremendously successful. But today, the questions that they have about how to take their business to the next level are very, very different from the questions that they had when they were here in the very beginning. And so what we've done is we've created this more holistic system that will help to guide you through no matter where you are in the process and no matter what direction you decide to go, once you hit that sort of full-time income or once your blog is, is at a level where you're really happy with it, it's succeeded. Because there are different paths you can take. Let me walk you through phase by phase real quick the different things in the blogging system so you can have an idea right now, whether you're in Project 24 or not, of exactly what sort of process to go through to get to a successful blog that's gonna earn you a fantastic income. Phase one is the compass phase. We call it the compass phase because it's meant to give you direction and it's something that you can refer to at any point in working through the blogging system. The first time through it, you're gonna spend a week or less in this phase and what you're gonna do is get direction on exactly how to pick the right niche for you. I say the right niche for you. I get the question a lot from people who say, what's the best niche of 2022? If you were starting a website right now, what would be the topic of the website? I say, well, <laughs> those are a couple different questions actually, because the best niche depends so much on you. If I were starting a new website today, which I do all the time, what I would pick for that website is probably gonna be different than what you should pick for that website. That's why it's far more important to be taught the principles of a good niche, as well as to be able to view examples of evaluating a niche. That's why we recently published a video on this channel where we quickly reviewed 75 different niches to give you an idea of the things that we look at when we pick a niche for a, for a new website. We also published a while back on this channel um, a video where I walked through the main criteria that we look at within Project 24 for what makes for a good niche for you. And the number one most important criterion is fit. How well does that niche fit you? Some of the best niche websites I've seen, some of the most successful that I've seen, have been on topics you might not have thought would be uber successful. Most people are like, well, I should do a blog in finance or exercise, fitness, weight loss. I mean, don't those do really well and make lots of money? Sure, for the people who succeed with them. But for most of us, we found that we can make a niche website in, uh, on topics like hobbies, you know, outdoors and sports, uh, various craft uh, hobbies. New <laughs> hobbies come up all the time because these are the kinds of things that people search for to get information about before buying products, before um, really getting into that hobby. Another one is careers, various different career paths. Making a website about a particular career path that you know a lot about, what it takes to get there, what sort of classes they'll have to take, what it's like working in that field. People research that stuff all the time, but it's not the obvious topic that most people think of, and so it's not the one that most people are going after, which actually makes it an even better niche for you. So in the compass phase, we're going to pick a good niche, and then we're ready to move on. Phase two is the starter phase. Now in this phase, we're gonna do a bunch of stuff. We're going to set up a website. We're going to do search analysis. We're gonna learn how to write a response post and how to write answer targets. These are all things that if you have no idea what I'm talking about, they're, they're, <laughs> there's so much to learn. And it's all happening here in about the first 30 days. And you're gonna write about 10 blog posts during this process, incorporating the skills that we're teaching. So let's go back <laughs> to the whiteboard and let me sort of break this out for you a little bit. Okay, we gotta dive a little deeper here in phase two into some of the details of what we're going to do. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is set up the website. Now that might feel um, like a lot kind of in one small space, but it actually is pretty straightforward. Again, we have tons and tons of material both on this YouTube channel, on our Income School Tutorials channel, and all over the web about how to set up a WordPress website, and you'll be able to get started on content. So let's dive into what that looks like. The first major thing that we need to do is what we call search analysis. Search analysis goes back to what we talked about in the beginning. It's identifying the things people are actually looking for. We don't need any special tools. Um, there's tons of keyword research tools out there. We don't need them to do this process. They can facilitate pieces of the process, but they're expensive and they can be tremendously misleading. So at this stage, I don't recommend using any of them. In fact, what I would do is start by using this 
and then by jumping over to Google. Let me show you just a little bit of an example. The first thing that we wanna do is identify within the niche that we've selected what specific things we wanna write about. When we start a brand new website, we don't want to cover an entire niche extremely broadly. Let's think of our niche using like a tree diagram, okay? So let's say that here's our, here is our broader niche and we could break that topic down into smaller subcategories. For example, if I were making a website about bicycling, I could certainly break that down into a whole bunch of components. Um, I honestly would probably even niche down and talk about a specific type of cycling. There's mountain biking, there's um, road cycling, there's racing, there's a ton of different types. But let's say we were to pick something like maybe even a specific type of cycling. Well, even within that, right, we have categories like equipment, there's one. We have maintenance. We have, um, you know, workouts, we're getting good at it. We have um, maybe different rides, like mapping out trails and stuff. These aren't just specific topics for specific blog posts. These are potentially entire categories of content, each of which could have a numerous blog posts within it. So what do we need to do? We need to narrow it down and we need to start with just a few. The reason for this is topical authority. It's extremely important that on our website, um, because the website really doesn't have just like five possible categories, believe it or not, most niches are gonna have dozens and dozens of potential categories of content you could write about. And if we write two or three blog posts in each one, we're gonna be spreading out the knowledge that we write about across so many different things, but without going very deep on any one of those things. And when we do that, we don't establish any authority on our website for any of those subtopics. Not to mention when it comes time to monetize your website, Google does not like to approve websites for ads that have categories with only a few blog posts within each one. Google classifies this as thin content, even if each individual blog post is really, really good. So what do we do in this phase? We pick just three categories or even subcategories. Even within maintenance, I might break that down to like parts, like the parts of the bicycle uh, and just caring for those parts. I might have another subcategory within maintenance that talks about maintenance schedules and when it's time to do each thing and then exactly how to do those types of maintenance. You could imagine how within each category, sometimes it'll be one category that you'll write everything. It's like five blog posts and you've covered the category. But sometimes even a category is so big that it could have a dozen subcategories within it, each with their five or 10 of their own blog posts. So we're gonna only pick about three of those specific categories where we think five to 10 blog posts would cover that topic pretty well. Next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to try to identify the types of questions that people are searching for online within that topic. For that, Google search is a great tool. We like to type in partial search queries, type half of a question and hit enter and see what Google brings up. The people also ask section, as well as the uh, related questions at the very bottom of the first page of Google that you often have, those are gonna give you an indication of some of the most commonly asked questions that are similar to the partial question that you asked. Let me show you one example of this. This is like pretty ninja stuff that we normally only talk about within Project 24. So when I say type in a partial question, we could do something like this. How often do bicycles now, auto suggest is gonna give me some stuff here, right? Like how much do bicycles cost? How long do cycles last? But with such a generic partial search like this, I'm only gonna get like pretty high level questions. But if I actually hit enter here, then I can go to the people also ask and see some specific questions people are typing into Google. How often do bikes break? Notice that they didn't just use the exact same words I did. I said bi bicycles, they said bikes. Do bikes have a lifespan? How long should I bike every day? It's a totally different question than how often do bikes break? Do cyclists ride every day? And if I open one of these, then notice I got a couple more, right? Now, the more of these that I open and open and open, I can end up with a huge list of people also ask questions and they're gonna get farther and farther away from the original partial search that I did. And then I mentioned the related questions at the bottom and notice here what I'm getting is an idea of what the search intent might be around how often bicycles, whatever. And I'm gonna get numerous ideas for searches that I could write resources, I could create articles that answer those questions. 
That's what we're doing with search analysis. Within Project 24, we have what we call the blogging tool. It is a uh, spreadsheet-based tool that has logic built into it. It helps us identify the types of partial search questions that we could type into Google. But what it also does is it helps us with the logic to determine which of these blog posts have likely enough search volume and aren't so competitive that even in the beginning, we have a good chance of ranking for those. It's a great place to start. Once we identify those topics though, we need to be able to write a good blog post. That's why we have created a post recipe to help write what we call response posts. Response posts take a specific search query and answer that question using about a thousand words. That may seem like a lot. The reality is though that most questions people type into Google where it's actually worth writing a full article about, the answer kind of is, it depends. But it doesn't help to just say that. It helps to say it depends on these factors. Here's why, or here's how it depends on those, and here's how to determine what the answer is based upon your situation. That's a much more helpful response than it depends, and then a whole bunch of fluff. Following the post recipe is what allows us to write very good blog posts in one to two hours, repeatably. I have videos on this channel where I've literally done it in front of the camera in under an hour, written well over a thousand words for articles that are ranking number one on Google a few years later. We're gonna make good use of answer targets, which is simply when we write a piece of content within a blog post that is intended to win Google's rich snippet. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check this out. Let's say I pick one of these, like uh, how long should I bike every day? And uh, let's say I actually go do that Google search. See this at the very top? Sometimes they'll have an image next to them, sometimes they won't but you'll notice that Google is providing sort of an answer that's pulled from somebody else's blog post, and they're doing it before the people also ask. This is what we typically refer to as the snippet. Now, sometimes those snippets are much more feature rich and do provide a more thorough answer right here on the spot. This looks a little bit more like a featured search result, but either way, it's sort of the same. It's the thing that shows up at the very top that tries to answer the question right there. So we like to craft answers to questions that we can place within our articles that are like that. And we have an entire methodology for how to write good answer targets of various types. Some should be lists, some should be tables. There are various different formats that we like to use for answer targets to help ensure that we can win that spot and get our content to show up at the very top of Google search. This is what phase two is all about creating the website, doing search analysis, and learning how to write good blog posts following the post recipe so that your content has the very best chance of showing up in Google search and actually attracting traffic to your website. Okay, so in phase one, we picked a niche. In phase two, we got everything set up and we wrote 10 posts. We are a month in, we only have 10 blog posts on a website, but you have a website and that should be really exciting. In phase three, you see that we're gonna start slowing down a little bit. Not slowing down in terms of the work that we do or the content or whatever, but rather we're gonna take more time in that phase because we're gonna be taking the time to really build out these skills and create content. The learning starts to slow down a little bit. I mean, this is just packed, packed with information. Here, we're focused a little bit less on learning a ton of new things and focused more on implementing the things that we're learning as well as then teaching you kind of the next piece, step by step by step. In the ignition phase, that's when, first of all, we see people tend to hit what we're currently calling curry day, hence the bowl of curry. Uh, that's when you earn the first $5 for your website. That may not seem like a big deal, but what we found is that once you start earning something, and by celebrating that success, our members get excited and they get motivated and they really wanna pick it up and they're able to achieve the much higher and higher and higher milestones until they hit full time. Just by having a small celebration, just by recognizing the first $5 earned, that can be the thing that shows you, that proves to you that this is working. In this phase, we're gonna finish site setup. We're gonna get everything just kind of laid out. So we don't have to worry about that stuff going forward and we can focus on content. We are also gonna create more content. In fact, we're gonna write 20 more posts before moving on to the next phase. In the traction phase, we're gonna learn about original research and all the different ways that we can do it, as well as how to write staple posts and the various formats that those different posts can take. There's kind of a right format for different types of content. In fact, 
Let's take a few minutes and dive into that a little bit more. I cannot tell you how important this phase is. Original research and staple posts, that is the focus of basically this entire phase. When we talk about original research, what we're saying is that we want to craft content that has something unique that no other website on the entire internet has. That may seem extremely hard to do. What most bloggers are doing is they're taking the topic that they chose to write about and then they're doing research literally on the web to find the answers. And they're finding other bloggers, those blog posts and using the information from those to sort of craft their version of the answer. What that doesn't do though is provide anything of unique value other than maybe pulling the opinions and uh, experience of a few different people and putting it into one place. What we like to do instead is one of various forms of original research. What you might do is a poll. You might participate in a Facebook group within your niche and you might go ask people within that group a question and use the responses to that question in the comments or even create a, an actual poll to be able to get some data that you can use in a blog post. That's original research. You might go to a forum and do the same thing, or you might find that someone else has already asked a question and that you've seen numerous people respond to it. You could use that information as data for as original research. Now, what you're doing is, yes, you're covering similar information of what was already covered in a forum somewhere, but now what you've done is you've turned that into data that's useful. There are several forms of original research that we recommend talking to an expert or doing some sort of an interview, um, running an experiment. We like to teach people how to run actual experiments uh, to be able to generate their own data. Notice I keep saying data. Data is extremely useful because data can be used um, in data tables and in infographics because what it can do is it can answer numerous questions that are very similar but different enough that they're searched differently. <laughs> Let me give you an example of that. On this website of ours, cookforfolks.com. I'm gonna do a quick search for how many. And you'll notice we actually have several blog posts that cover this type of question. So I'm gonna click into this one. How many deviled eggs per person? This is gonna answer the question, have at least two deviled eggs prepared per person. But then within the blog post, there's gonna be a table that says for this certain number of people, here's how many deviled eggs. Now this is extremely simple math, but in some of the blog posts, it's not quite that straightforward. How much mashed potatoes, like in cups, uh, do you need for 30 people? We're gonna answer that question, but we're gonna put numbers in a table. So we've answered the question for 30 and 40 and 50 and 100. And in doing so, we allow our content to potentially rank not only for how many deviled eggs do you need per person, but also how many deviled eggs do you need for 20 people? Notice how those are very similar questions, but they're not the same but we've answered both in a blog post because we've done some research and we've put together data in a really nice format. We're also gonna talk about staple posts in this phase. Staple posts are longer blog posts, usually 2,000 words or more. Now, we don't like blog posts getting super long, like 6,000 words. At that point, it's probably time to break up the topic into more blog posts and link between them. But there are many topics that merit more than 1,000 words. There's just too much information or it's just too big of a topic to cover that specifically. Typically, these kinds of blog posts could rank for numerous search queries, not just one. That makes them extremely powerful and often means that they drive more traffic on average than your typical response post. Writing this kind of content, using original research, writing staple posts, and then properly interlinking between the content on our website allows our website to grow substantially in authoritativeness, but also just in the reach that we have across all the search engines. So in this phase, we're gonna spend at least four months. We're gonna write a bunch more content. And it's probably in this phase that you're gonna earn your first $100 month. So that's not the first total, you know, you've earned $100 from your website, but that's getting to a point where your website is continuously generating about $100 a month in residual income. It's actually pretty incredible when you think about it. It's also important to get a lot of practice doing the things we teach. So we're gonna write at least 20 staple posts. That doesn't mean we're only gonna write 20 posts, it means we're gonna write at least 20 staple posts, but we're also probably gonna be writing some response posts to fill in some of the content clusters that we've been building up up to this point. So you're gonna have quite a bit of content on your website by the time this is done, not just the 50 posts listed here. Okay, now it's time for some momentum. In the momentum phase, in phase five, 
we're gonna take our website to the next level. Notice we've talked a lot about content. We've talked about setting it up. We got great content that matches search queries. We're getting traffic at this point. But in this phase, we're gonna make our website grow substantially from a traffic standpoint, but also we're gonna make our website much more secure from a competition standpoint. We are gonna focus a lot on building EAT. EAT in and of itself is a gigantic topic, but let me introduce you to at least a few principles of EAT. EAT is a huge topic. We actually in Project 24 have an entire course for EAT that uh, we link out to from the blogging system. And that's because there are numerous different ways we can establish EAT, but let's cover it in a nutshell. EAT is an acronym that stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. Essentially, Google is constantly trying to find a better and better ways to measure the expertise, the authoritativeness, and the trustworthiness of your content. That means measuring the EAT of your website, of you as an author on your website, and of the articles themselves. There are a lot of ways they measure this, and one of them is through backlinks but backlinks is being relied upon less and less and less by Google and other search engines because it's the easiest one to manipulate. So we have identified several ways for you to build organic EAT. In doing so, we often end up getting natural links to our website, which is exactly what the search engines want us to do. That's why they measure backlinks in the first place. But those backlinks end up being highly relevant for the most part and are organically created, so we stand basically zero risk of Google ever suspecting us of manipulating their algorithm. In building EAT, we want to create relationships with other people in our industry. A lot of bloggers are really cagey about what their niche is, and they don't want to talk to other bloggers because they're afraid of content theft. When we build EAT, content theft becomes a non-issue because if somebody else could create the exact same article that we wrote, but if we have the EAT, we win we will outrank their content. So some of the ways that we build this, we like to go get ourselves interviewed on people's podcasts, on their YouTube channels. Guess what happens when you get interviewed in one of those and they're published online? You tend to get a boost of traffic from people coming over from listening or watching that video. But we also tend to get a link and that link feeds Google's algorithm just like every other backlink, except these are links that are generated again naturally because of an actual connection that we made. Can we write a guest post? Sure, but rather than reaching out to hundreds of people we've never met before, we recommend creating relationships with other people within your industry. Within Project 24, we've created EAT groups, so you can go join a group within an industry and find other people with blogs that are similar to yours, and you can reach out to them, and you can create a relationship, you can guest post content, you can support one another and really grow from the benefit of that EAT, but you can only really do that if you're in an environment where there's trust. And so that's why we have that within Project 24. We're gonna obviously keep writing content while we're in the momentum phase. We certainly don't wanna stop there, but we are definitely taking some time to focus on that EAT building. So graduating or moving on from this phase should only happen once you at least have some kind of ongoing EAT resources established and you've created some uh, connections with other, uh, other content creators, um, some, maybe some YouTube channels, podcasts, maybe even other um, blogs, other websites in your industry that you can collaborate with. So we need EAT resources before we move on. All right, at this stage, we now need to start looking at revenue. Early on in this process, back in phase three, we're introducing on our website some more passive forms of monetization, basic affiliate marketing, um, ads for the website, that sort of stuff. In phase six, we're going to identify the best methods of monetization for you, as well as for the website that you've created. And we're going to optimize the revenue so that you can hit this $1,000 a month milestone quickly, but also quickly get yourself up to the full-time income. Let's go talk about some of those different forms of monetization so you can see what sorts of things you might wanna consider on your website if this is about where you are in the process. We found on average that Project 24 members today, or this year at least, are earning over $30 per thousand page views that come to their website. That means if you can get 50,000 page views per month on your website, you're earning at least $1,500, at least as an average. They're doing that typically through a couple forms of monetization that are fairly passive. There are passive forms of monetization and then there are some very active forms of monetization. The passive forms of monetization that most bloggers are gonna use are ads, 
We use programmatic ads. We're not talking about like AdSense and just loading ads on the website. We're talking about using a programmatic ad provider that's going to serve ads both from Google as well as from other platforms that are going to help optimize the earning potential of those ads on the website. The second one is through affiliate marketing. This is where we recommend products and if somebody uses our link to go buy that product, we earn a commission for that. Our approach to affiliate marketing is really different from what most everybody else does. In fact, we've developed four distinct strategies for affiliate marketing that helps ensure that we're using the right approach, the right strategy for each piece of content where we do affiliate linking. What we don't recommend is just putting links in every single blog post or just writing a whole bunch of product reviews hoping that some people click on them and end up going and clicking over and buying the product. We focus on content first and then the monetization comes. These are mostly passive because once we create the content itself, the work to earn this income is basically already done. We just earn money in our sleep and don't really have to do much with it other than potentially you know, update affiliate links over time. The more active forms of monetization take the shape of maybe a little bit more traditional business model, what you might have thought of, like e-commerce. You can actually sell products on your website. Selling physical products could be fulfilled by Amazon or some, somebody else but there usually is a higher level of effort that goes into fulfilling every order. So it's not a very passive form of monetization. Likewise, lead generation. And that's where, that's where people come to our website, they find some information they like, they want more information from someone who can sell them a product or service. So we go and provide their information to a professional that you know lives in their area or whatever and can provide them with that service. And again, we receive payment for giving them that lead. This is a pretty active form of monetization in most industries, but it works really well in some cases. We teach how to do Patreon and other memberships. These are more active as well because typically if somebody joins a membership, there's an expectation that they're gonna receive some higher level of service or some higher level of information for their membership. So the, the effort, the things we have to provide for them tend to be ongoing. There's one I'm gonna put in the middle here that's actually my favorite form of monetization. This is info, info products. Now it's info products, but really I could categorize this as digital products. This is where we create something, whether maybe it's a piece of software, but oftentimes it's, it's information, it's training, it's course material that we generate now and then we're able to sell that piece of information over and over and over again to different people. And every time somebody puts in an order, the work that we have to do is already done. They've made the purchase, we use software to provide them with the information they paid for, and we make substantially more income from this than from really any of the others. And believe it or not, we've seen opportunities for info products in so many different niches where you might not have thought that was even possible. Now, the only reason I put it in the middle and not on the passive side is because there's a spectrum to this. You can have an info product that's tied to a membership, kind of like Patreon, but more like what we have in Project 24. That's gonna require, obviously, ongoing effort. What I do for Project 24 members is ongoing. It's not at all passive. On the other end of the spectrum, you could create an info product, think like an ebook, but usually more successful as like a video course or guide, maybe some audio components, oftentimes a bundle of information, um, worksheets, those kinds of things. And those can be served automatically when somebody makes that purchase. Even in that case, it's not totally passive because typically if you're selling something, there's gonna be some amount of customer support needed. So in Project 24, we're gonna teach about all these. This is, these are kind of the lead examples of how people are making really good income from their blogs. And it, by using some of these like info products, members are often pushing that number that I mentioned at the beginning, around $30, and they're pushing that substantially higher simply because they have a much more high value product here than an ad, which is a fairly low value product. And it's simply just a way to monetize the content, which is great because it's so passive. We aren't moving on from phase six until actually we hit the $1,000 a month milestone. That's one of the main requirements or sort of gradua graduation um, signals that tells us that we're ready to move on to phase seven. Phase seven with the pot of gold here, uh, the pot of gold represents hitting that full-time income milestone. In Project 24, we define that at $4,000 a month. There are a lot of people for whom $4,000 a month is not a full-time income, certainly wouldn't be worth quitting their job over yet, but they're well on the way to whatever a full-time income looks like for them. 
There are many other members of Project 24 for whom $4,000 a month would be incredible. And it is a full-time income and they'd probably quit their job much sooner. This though is the authority phase. In this phase, we're gonna focus a lot on ways to build out our authoritativeness much more. We're gonna build on some of the EAT that we learned in the momentum phase, but we're also going to start looking at potentially other platforms so that we can have a bigger presence. That doesn't necessarily mean that now we gotta go create a Facebook group and we gotta go do all these other things. However, we're gonna introduce you to many different options so you can identify what's gonna be best, again, for you as well as for the website you've created. For some people, they're gonna to want to build a YouTube channel, they're gonna to wanna to grow that, build huge authority, make a massive brand. Other people are going to wanna to take a totally different path. Let's talk about some of those paths that various members of Project 24 have taken and that you might wanna consider once you're here in phase seven. In phase seven, the biggest decision you really need to make is where you're gonna go from here. Really, it's kinda of like that Robert Frost poem about roads diverging, but you're going down this road following the steps, going through these phases, and suddenly you reach a fork, and you realize, now I have to decide where I'm gonna go. And you could go down this one path here, and what this path is, is taking the website that you've made and really becoming an authority or a brand. That means building it up, usually becoming present on multiple channels. So using video content as well as your blogging content. It may mean um, involved, being more involved in social media. It may mean writing a book to establish some substantial authority. It usually just means building a brand and real authority around the product you've already created. This can be a great way to make a fantastic income. Another path that a lot of people take is what I like to call rinse and repeat. And that is we're gonna take this same process that we've done and we're gonna do it again and again. Now obviously the learning part you've done, you've worked your way through all of the different phases and you've become really good at this. And so you're gonna be able to do this a second time much more quickly. And you'll be able to incorporate both response and staple posts from the very beginning. You'll be able to use all the different methods of search analysis from the very beginning. But we're talking about building a second website, a third website, fourth, fifth, and on and on and on. And having a portfolio of websites that help diversify your income stream and really diversifies the risk. If any one particular industry were to start getting dominated by some other brand or um, suddenly became taboo or some of the products you relied on as uh, affiliate products are no longer available, any number of things that could go wrong because they're outside of your control. So we do this and we minimize our risk. The option that I do see some people taking, including myself in a lot of ways, is somewhere in the middle. And really it's not two paths it's more like a spectrum. And you could go anywhere along this spectrum. I dedicate most of my time to the authority. That's where I am here today. I teach people how to create content. But I also know that it works so well that I wanna do this myself, and I do. I am constantly building websites, and I've built a team around that to help scale that business in addition to having a team that is supporting the income school business. Now it's particularly important for me because in order to teach this, I need to still actively be doing it. Otherwise, the stuff that I say is gonna get dramatically outdated very quickly. But it's also a great way to kind of have some of the best of both worlds. The authority on the one side allows you to be able to take one business and one brand and be able to do a ton of good with it. You can have substantially more influence and do a lot of good and make a fantastic income from one website. But we talked about the benefits of the rinse and repeat model. So I fall somewhere probably about right there. And in phase seven, we try to provide resources for people that will help them at either end of the spectrum, as well as obviously kind of anywhere in between. Now, notice the timeline for phase seven. I say seven months and beyond. That's because there really isn't a graduation from phase seven. In phase seven, we are going to potentially start over again on another website we are going to potentially continue on with a content strategy for this website, keep creating more content, build out the brand some more, but keep it fairly passive. We may choose to take some of those other paths that we talked about um, by creating content for YouTube as well as other platforms and building a brand, maybe even creating products. I mean, the sky's the limit here, right? So depending on which path you choose to take, things are going to look different for you. However, 
we are creating resources within Project 24 for people no matter what path they choose to go on. If you want to scale that business through growing that one brand versus scaling that business by, again, bringing on team members to be able to do all of this work, but at scale, so you can build a portfolio of websites. Uh, it just really depends on what you want to do, and those resources are going to be there for every path you choose to take. Now, I mentioned before the compass phase. Really, at the end of every phase, we're actually going to come back here. Because in the compass phase, it's really every phase, but that would get kind of crowded with arrows, so I'll stop there. But you get the idea. In the compass phase, we have resources like our battleship method. Um, we have resources about uh, reviewing the way that we've um, outlined our site, and so we can sort of do an audit and determine if the, the categories and the concepts that we're choosing to cover on our website are the right ones. What we want to do is really at every stage of building out our website, and probably at multiple times through momentum, revenue, and authority, we're going to want to go back and reassess. So whether you're in Project 24 or not, I want you to consider that. We want to go back and reassess what our website is and what we want it to be. What's sort of the organization of the content of our website? Are we covering the topics that we want to cover? Have we uncovered some new opportunities that we need to add to our search analysis? Are we periodically doing an audit of our own website to determine if it's really like performing as well as it should? All of these are things that we're going to look at as we go back to the compass phase at various stages. We definitely want to be battleshipping our content after about a year and about every six months after that to make sure that that content is performing as well as it should. But doing a full site audit is also important as well because it helps us uncover things site-wide that aren't necessarily content specific, but that might be holding us back from doing as well as we should. That's what the blogging system is all about. It is meant to be cyclical, it's meant to be holistic, and at any point along the way, we may consider going back, reevaluating search analysis, making sure that we haven't strayed too far from the process. We're gonna be learning more about search analysis in every single phase. There's just so much to be had and so much to be learned that obviously I can't cover it all here in this one video, and that's why we literally have dozens, if not over 100 hours of training materials within Project 24 to help make sure that you have all the resources that you need to be successful. All right, let's go back to the office. I have a few more things I wanna to talk to you about related to the blogging system and how you can be more successful with blogging. One of the really frustrating things about trying to do this sort of business is that there's a gap between kind of your, your taste, your ability to recognize what's good and your experience and your ability. Right? We know, we can tell if like, okay, I go out to a, 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 a sandwich shop, right? And there's a sandwich, I just know it's really good, I love it, I know it's a good sandwich, right? But I wanna go create that sandwich myself, and even though I think I know the ingredients and I put it together, it does not taste the same. Trust me, I have tried. <laughs> it's not the same, right? Knowing how to create the thing that's amazing and recognizing what's amazing are not the same thing. At this point, if you're looking into this at all, you probably can tell, you've seen it. You know when a blog looks really salesy and really cringy, you know when the content is low quality. You can recognize it. But if you were to go try to create your own blog, you might not do a whole lot better. Fortunately, we've tested and refined this process, so we know exactly what the ingredients are. I've been walking you through several of them. Now, unfortunately, I can't take the time in this one video to walk you through everything. And on this channel, realistically, we, I mean, we cover pieces of it. But what we've done for Project 24 members is we've laid it out step by step by step, phase by phase, piece by piece, providing resources for every step along the way. The point here is you're gonna need a guide, you're gonna need a process. If what you're doing is you're going to YouTube, hoping to pick up tips and tricks, and then somehow combine them all together into a system that'll work for you, that's gonna take you substantially more effort than if you just follow a system. Now, if you are gonna try to piece it all together and create your own system, I recommend at least staying consistent on that. There are a lot of people teaching on YouTube how to be successful as a content creator, but the methodologies are so divergent, they're so different. The, the tactics that they're teaching are so, in some cases, like opposing to one another, that knowing what's gonna work for you is extremely difficult to do until you find success. When I got into this, I had a little bit of a guide. Jim had succeeded in building a website, a couple websites even. He had even bought some and improved them and sold them. He had a little bit of a process, 
But that's what he had was just a little bit of a process. He had a knack, he knew what was good and he could replicate it because he's a smart guy. Over the next several years, he and I took what he had figured out on his own. And on our own, we figured out a repeatable process that we could teach. We could do it over and over and over again and we continue to do so, but we also teach it. And hundreds and hundreds of people now are finding success and earning a good income for their families by following this simple methodology that we've laid out. It's been so effective that, I'll share this, and I've never, I've never shared this really publicly before, but the renewal rate for our members is about 70%. That's not saying that 70% of people who signed up once will come back for a second year. It means that 70% of all members at any time will renew when renewal comes. And that includes people who have been here for four years they're still renewing at a rate of about 70%. About a year ago, I was talking to actually a banker about a business loan, and they asked me that question specifically. What's your renewal rate? Because I told them that I had a membership, a subscription, and I told them it's about 70%. And they gave me a look of like complete and utter shock because that's unheard of. For the most part, we have a tendency to, especially in an information type product, get in there, get the information that we need, maybe participate a little bit, and then leave. But what we've built here is not just some information. We've put together all the resources that we have been able to identify and realistically create in order to help you be successful, and we've put them all into one thing. A lot of people like to tout their communities. We, we know about communities within our own industry that the community alone is costing over $600 a year. And those communities for the most part are not nearly as active as the community that we have in Project 24. Our members are extremely active. Almost never do I see someone post a question or a concern or even just a topic of discussion in the community that doesn't almost immediately have multiple responses from other members who have been there and experienced the same thing. And we at Income School, all of us on the team, are participating in that community as well, responding to questions, asking questions, and really being a part of this amazing community of people who are really invested in supporting one another in their success. Now, there are a few reasons why some people don't succeed at this. And frankly, that's why we don't have a 100% renewal rate or even a 100% success rate. And really it just comes down to a few things. Number one, if they just didn't follow the system, we do get people who come in and they are just looking for some tips and they want to incorporate that into everything else they already know. And they kind of have their own plan and they try to follow that and they may not succeed. I find that unfortunate. If you're going to try to follow this blogging system, follow this blogging system. There may come a time later on when you have learned the fundamentals and practiced them so well that you understand how they fit in, at which point incorporating learnings from all over, that's a great thing to do. But you need to pick a system. You need to pick one approach and you need to follow that. If it's been proven, if someone's actually been doing it successfully, follow that system to success. The second reason is we get people who, they want the success but they don't want to put in the work and so they outsource too quickly. If you don't take the time to learn all of these skills and you quickly wanna outsource the work, get somebody else to write your content, it's a, it's a good thing to do, right? To be able to scale your business. But if you do it too soon before you've learned it yourself, the, the odds are you're not going to recognize if the content you got back really was the content that was gonna be successful. We find that this is one indicator that somebody may not succeed. The third reason, and probably the main reason why uh, people don't succeed is that they give up too soon. There is a delay in this process. You don't immediately get results. In fact, it takes several months before you earn your first $5 typically. And that's normal. In fact, it's a good thing. If this were easy and we had immediate results, the competition would be dramatically higher. But people want results right away. And so there are many people who start this process, don't see quick success, and give up, even if they were doing everything right, before they even have a chance to succeed. That's one of the reasons why we try to provide a very realistic timeline of expectations. If you know what to expect, then it's not that bad when you know it's just a few months off. This is called Project 24 for a reason. It's because the plan 
is to take approximately 24 months to replace a full-time income. 24 months feels like a long time, but I want you to think back 24 months. 24 months ago, what were you doing? And how long ago does that feel like? Typically, when we look back, we recognize how quickly time is passing. But when we look forward, things seem so far away. If you had started this 24 months ago, there's a good chance you could have replaced your full-time income by now. Now, I wanna put something in perspective. Again, if that seems like a long time, let me show you something else. I am definitely an advocate for investing. I think everybody should be investing. I think planning for your own retirement and not, not just relying on um, government or a pension or whatever else is out there. Uh, it's risky if we're going to expect somebody else to cover us in retirement. So I'm all about it. Let's go invest. But let me show you something. If you were to take the cost of Project 24, I'm just gonna use that as a starting point, right? So Project 24 for two years, it's gonna cost you 449 in the first year and 249 in every year after that that you decide to stay. So we're talking about under $700, but for round number's sake, we're gonna take $700. Now, how long in the stock market is it gonna take for this $700 if we invested it today and turn that into a $4,000 per month income that you could be getting from a website. Well, at a 6% average market return annually, which is half a percent per month, in order to get to $4,000 a month, guess how much money you need to actually have invested? $800,000. You know how long it's gonna take that $700 to turn into the 800,000? It's gonna take almost 118 years. It's a lot more than two. The return on this investment financially is like insane. The biggest investment you're gonna to need to be willing to make in this is your time. And that's an investment you need to make whether you join Project 24 or not. Now, I just mentioned the pricing and really whether you join Project 24 or not, that's, that's totally up to you. We do have a process, we do have a system. It's all laid out for you there. I, I can't tell you just how valuable um, it truly is and how dramatically underpriced it really is. But even if you choose to do this on your own, I still want to invite you to follow this system, follow this plan, recognize the timeline. This is a proven business model that works and it's incredible the kind of return you can earn even if you're gonna go it alone. Now, when it does come to Project 24, there's one more thing that I wanna share and that is about the pricing. I said $700, now that's spread out over two years, but we are at a time where we're seeing a lot of these like economic adjustments, right? We're seeing a lot of inflation. Um, costs are going up, everything's going up. Everything's more expensive. And as a result of that, the prices for all the things we're buying are typically going up. And so at this time, I need to make an important announcement. And that is that for the time being, Income School will not be raising the price of Project 24. My goal, my desire, is to help as many people as I can to be able to follow a proven path to be able to get to success. I want you to be able to provide an income for yourself and for your family. I want you to be able to achieve the goals and have the life that you want. I want you to be able to get out from under whatever pressures are holding you down and preventing you from being able to live a life that you wanna be able to live. And so I'm making the pricing for Project 24 as affordable and as approachable as it has ever been. And that even in an economic environment where the cost of everything is going up dramatically. It's not gonna be able to stay that way forever, especially if the inflationary powers continue in the direction that they are. But for as long as I can, I'm gonna hold the pricing where it's at. This is insane. I'm being told literally by members of my team that we are not charging enough. That the other courses they're seeing out there, that the other programs, the other communities and stuff that they're seeing out there are charging dramatically more. And we should probably do the same. But I would rather make this affordable for you so that you can succeed if you want to go this route. So I hope you'll take advantage of that and join me now in Project 24. But whether you do or not, thanks for being here on this channel. Thanks for watching my video. And I hope to see you again soon. I mean, really, we have this like huge library of videos here for you to watch to be able to learn how to be successful with blogging. So make sure that you don't miss a single one because there's so much good content for you to learn. We'll see you in there.